Now I'm very pleased to introduce you to Professor Hoyt Long from the Department of East Asian St Languages and Civilizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth, and thank you for that warm uh, welcome. Uh, as always, we're very happy to uh, have iHouse um, help co-sponsor uh, this event. This is the 11th Najita Distinguished Lecture, uh, and this is part two. So for those of you who were here last night, you may be feeling a sense of deja vu. <laughs> um, but uh, last night, we screened uh, Professor Oguma's film. Uh, tonight, he's going to give a lecture uh, related to some of the things that we saw in that film. Uh, let me thank again, though, uh, the C staff uh, for their tremendous support in putting this together, uh, and to the Japan Studies Committee uh, for their support of this uh, of the Najita Lecture Series. I want to say just a little bit before I introduce Professor Ogima. I want to just say a little bit about the, the lecture series for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, professor Tetsuo Najita is the Robert S. Ingersoll Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of History and East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and he actually joined the faculty at UFC in 1969. Uh, and retired in 2002, and throughout that time wrote extensively on Japan's early modern and modern intellectual history. Uh, he's still publishing uh, as, early as, as recently as 2008. He published a new work in Japanese on the topic of doing intellectual history. And in 2009, uh, he published uh, in English, Ordinary Economies in Japan, a Historical Perspective, 1759 to 1950. Um, and this impressive body of scholarship is, is organized by the assertion that historians must always engage with the moral and political issues of their time, an assertion that has inspired many of his students, um, and it's certainly an assertion that describes well the ethos of our guest tonight, uh, Professor Oguma Eiji. So, professor Oguma comes to us from Keio University in Tokyo, where he's a professor of policy management. Uh, he has a, a wide-ranging, his scholarship is wide-ranging and voluminous. Uh, he's covered such topics as national identity and nationalism, politics, colonial policy, democracy and social movements in modern Japan, and, and, and democracy and social movements in modern Japan. Uh, he's won many prizes for these publications, um, and his work has been instrumental in uncovering the social processes that have gone to construct national identity at different periods in Japan's modern history. His first major work of scholarship came out in 1996 and was translated into English as A Genealogy of Japanese Self-Images. Uh, the well-known writer Murakami Ryu apparently said of the work that it had been a very long time since he'd come across a book as interesting as this one. I'm not sure how often he says that, but I, I, I feel this, I, I, I think the sentiment ring, rings true. It's also one of the first books I came across uh, when I began my graduate career at the University of Michigan. Um, and I, I remember being astounded uh, by the way it, it really explodes the myth of ethnic Japanese homogeneity and shows it to be a post-war construction rather than a product of the Meiji state. In fact, one of the most memorable aspects of the work is the way it enriches the history of how Japanese-ness was imagined in the colonial period and how narrow that range of imagination became after the end of the, of the Pacific War. He followed this book with uh, uh, another book in 1998 called The Boundaries of the Japanese, which looks at the evolution of Japan as nation state and how the policies of inclusion or exclusion of minorities have altered with the nation's shifting economic and political status. And his, his more recent works continue some of the th same themes. Uh, his 2002 Democracy and Patriots was a response to the controversial and widely publicized history textbook debates of that period. Um, and more recently, he's written on the year 1968, uh, one of the high points of social revolt, as well as a biography of his father who fought in the Pacific War and was held prisoner in Siberia until 1948. Um, and in talking about this work with, with Oguma last night over dinner, it became clear how he's, just, he's driven by this compulsion to collect and document and record those parts of, the social, of social history that are so easily forgotten. Um, I think it's reflected in the documentary that we saw last night, um, in which he'll be talking about, and it may be reflected in his, his, some of his other activities, including a side gig as a musician uh, in a band called Kikion, which plays folk music from around the world, and in which he plays both guitar and the traditional, uh, traditional Greek instrument. Uh, so he's a man of many talents, and I'd like you to please join me in welcoming him, welcoming him tonight uh, for, the, for the Najita Lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming and uh, thank you for introductions. 
And I appreciate the Center for Eastern Asian Studies uh, who organized this event. And uh, this says, you know, keynote speech in Japanese with English translation. <laughs> and uh, let me explain why I decided to uh, make this speech in Japanese. And uh, I gave lectures in Mexico and Germany. And uh, however, I once I was told uh, by a professor, uh, Professor Ogma, your English is working. However, somewhat, sometimes sounds pretty <laughs> too much <laughs> and lacking somewhat dignity. So that uh, I said to myself, uh, you know, when I got the offer from, you know, uh, Professor Hoytron uh, to give, you know, Natsuta Distinguished Lecture. That should be full of dignity. So that I decided to make the speech in Japanese with English subtitles. And uh, let me make research. And please raise your hand if you would have watched uh, my film in last night. Okay, okay, I see. And next, and uh, please raise your hand if you would not understand Japanese. Okay, I see. No. <laughs> uh, okay, I will sometimes switch in English uh, when I, you know, give additional explanation. Okay? No. Let me start. First, titles, instability, crisis in politics, and new social, new social movements. Yes, now I will shift to Japanese word. It's all right? <laughs> hey. Title wa instability, crisis of politics, social movements. De, watashi wa mazu saisho ni political theory. Next, Japanese history. それからプレゼントシチュエーションインジャパンを話します、えー、このインスタビリティクライシス・オブ・ポリティクスアンド・ニュー・ソーシャル・ムーブメントは決して日本にだけ特殊なテーマではありませんまず、えー、思想的あるいは理論的な説明から話します、えーしかし普遍的なものというのは場所や時代によって個別の現れ方をしますからそのために日本の社会における歴史と現状を説明しますそれから歴史といっても70年代以降になります OK May I move? Chapter 1 Political Theory はい近代というのはどういう時代かモダニティこれはインスタビリティの時代ですえー、インスタビリティが増していくことが近代だというふうに言ってしまってもいいかもしれませんではなぜ近代になるとインスタビリティがインクリースするのかこれは私は近代がフリーウィルというものを評価するからだと思います May I move? OK、まあ、私はクリスチャンじゃありませんが聖書を読んだことはありますで聖書を読んだところによると、えー、フリーウィルの始まりはアダムとイムが知恵の実を食べたところから始まったとされているようですでまあ西洋の、えー、思想家例えばジャン・ジャック・ルソーは、えー、フリーウィルというのは不公平が増していくということと、えー、進歩の原動力であるというふうに考えていたようですで人類というものは、えー、もちろんずっと習慣の中にいれば安定していますがそれでは進歩もなければ経済的な成長も技術の科学の進歩もありません。OK? May I move to the next? で近代というのは、えーまあ、人間は自由意志を肯定的に評価するようになりました
。で近代化が進むと不平等と不安定と、えー、政治の危機が生じます。で不平等はなぜ政治の危機につながるのか。で政治学者は時々理性的な判断をするミドルクラスが減るからだというふうに説明します。しかしもう少し分析が必要です。By middle class, women, people who have a certain level of the property beyond the minimum, the position of the property free us from poverty. で、もし人間が貧困やテラーに脅かされていると、理性的な判断になるということはできません。That's why many of the government focus on freedom from poverty and terrors. May I move to next? Okay. But property and income are not the same thing. Income を増やすためにはリスクを取らなければいけません。リスクを取るとプロパティがディミニッシュするパスビリティがあります。そう。えー、つまり、インカムを増やすためにはリスクを取らなければならず、それは人間が理性を失っていくことにつながる可能性があるわけですね。The philosopher of the ancient Greece was well aware of these matters. Plato, for example, held that of the increase of the number of the people who were to sell their land for money, humans would grow distant from the The idea of the good and leading to tyrannical rules. And also, Aristotle's distinguished between chromatics, the art of the making money, and the economy, you know, the original world of economics, the art of the stabilizing life. Okay? Next. May I? Okay? Okay. Hi. ハンナーレント、えー、彼女はこういう古代ギリシャの思想に影響されていましたで彼女はプロパティとワルスを区別しましたここでのプロパティというのは世界にテイキングパートオキパイングパートすることですでそしてサステインマイデイリーウェルビーイングですねでこれがプロパティの役割ですで。プロパティを持つことによって、オーナーシップとプロパティ、ギャランティー、you know, メンバーシップ、インコミュニティ。しかし、ウェルス、on the other hand、こういう働きを持ちません。ウェルスはただのインカムです。ですから、プロパティのように、世界の中に場所を占めて、ポリティカルイッシュに対してレスポンシブルになるというような働きをしないのがインカムです。So that if we were, you know,、uh, categorize middle class by only income, it would not be enough.Do you understand?Okay?Next. で、アーレントは、モダニティというのは、プロパティがどんどん消費とコンシューミング、コンサンプション、ディストラクション。そしてこのプロセスはインスタビリティにとポリティカルクライシスにつながっていきます。The human being cannot long endure such a situation. So, in order to make their lives stable, People began to create communities and the social conditions of the modernity, even in modernity. The, for example, labor unions and family. The family, traditional family, というのは、つまり、男性が働いて賃金、ウェージを得ることによって、キープス、メインテインされているわけですから、これは近代の産物だということになりますね。そして
こういう近代の、えー、コミュニアルフォームを可能にしているのはステーブルエンプロメントですなぜならば without men being employed over the long term the family form in which women dedicated themselves to housework cannot maintain us It's also easy to organize men who were employed at the same workplace of an unextended period in labor unions. そして、エンプロイメントというのは、ただ単にインカムを保障するだけではない。えー、エンプロイメントというのは、ストライブザリス、タビライズ、デム、オーバー、ギブン、ピリオド、アンド、タイム、イン、ギブン、セット、オブ、ザ、リレーションズですね。The employment to you know, in other words, occupation, occupying a place in the world. であるというふうに考えることができます。Okay? で、accordingly, if employment is stabilized, then it is easy in there for politics to be stable, stable as well. 20世紀の間はソーシャルデモクラティック・パーティーズ・イン・オール・アラン・ド・ワールド・ウェイズ・レーバー・ユニオンズ・アッデ・ベース・アンド・コンサベティブ・パーティーズ・ウェイズ・ファミリーズ・アンド・チャーチェズ・アッデ・ベース・レッド・ポリティカル・スタビリティでこういった政党は両方とも安定した雇用・エンプロイメントによってファミリーとレーバー・ユニオンがギャランティードされることによって成り立っていたわけですね。よろしいでしょうか。May I move to next? Okay. しかし、マニファクチャリングは20世紀は、えー、とてもたくさんあったわけです。で、マニファクチャリングが重要だったのは、えー、あまり教育のないえーまあ、教育のレベルが比較的高くない、えー、男性に安定した雇用を与えていましたでこういった男性たちがレーバーユニオンとファミリーを維持していったわけですそしてしかしアウトソースフォーオーバーシーズとコンピュータテクノロジーインフォメーションテクノロジーがこの条件をなくしてしまったわけです May I move to next? Okay. In the present age, however, neither this form of the employment nor politics is viable. で、こういったことは世界中に普遍的になってしまいました。えー、いわゆる two major political parties. It means conservative parties, which based on families and church, and a social democratic party, which based on labor unions. Lost their power or undergone transformation. What can we do in the face of such tendencies? That is a problem. So, we are not going to be able to get the income of the income. Only the income was not guaranteed stability. Property is critical. で、GDP は、要するに、マーケットでコンシューミングされないプロパティを GDP doesn't count ですね。そして、エンプロイメントがただ単に増えても、スタビリティがなければダメなんです。アンステーブルジョブズばかり増えても、安定しない。なぜならば、アンステーブルジョブは、は、not guarantee sense of the occupying a place in the world。だからです。occupying a place in the world were connected to the you know, responsibility for the community and the world。Okay? Next。はい。こういう状況のもとで、since 2011。New kind of social movement has begun to appear in the various places around the world. They are tried to occupy a place in the world. It's very interesting for me. 
and in Egypt, New York, Spain, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Tokyo also, as you have watched in my frame in last night. And uh, there are today, numerous people have been giving speeches and conducting debates at uh, occupying places. Occupying friends mean that they try to occupy their own places in the world. This, uh, that is my understanding. Okay? このことはアーレントがヒューマンアクションというものを重視したことを思い出せます。えー、アーレントはヒューマンアクション、その中でもスピーチアクトというものをとても重視しました。まあ、彼女はあのソーシャルという言葉は嫌いましたからすあけれども、えー、実質的に he, she, you know,、uh, praised a social movement in the 1960s. For example, civil rights movement in the 1960s. Okay? Hi. Political theory is not my specialization, so I will not continue to further. <laughs> the keeping the above point in mind, I will now turn my attention to Japanese politics and Japanese social movements. Okay? Okay, let's move to chapter second Japanese history. Yeah? Let me now turn to the Japanese history from the 1970s on. There are certain markers in post war Japanese history, and when I have you know, occasion to lecture abroad on Japanese contemporary history, this is a story I sometimes tell. Okay, next. This is my lecture, a part of my lecture, okay? The Prime Minister of Japan changed all the time, so, and it's hard to remember their names. So let me tell you the simplest way to keep tracks. First of all, the Prime Ministers from 1945 to 1954 were diplomats. This is because the job of the Prime Minister was to negotiate with the U.S. occupation of forces. And domestic politics might have been unstable at that time. But the prime minister of that era could speak English because they are diplomats. <laughs> and he is famous diplomat and prime minister, Mr. Yoshida. Okay? Next. From 1955 to 1992, the prime ministers were regional bosses or ex bureaucrats. During this period, bureaucrats made policy and regional bosses unified the local populations. And politics and economy were stable, but the prime minister of this period could not speak English because they are not diplomats. And he is very famous local boss, Mr. Tanaka, <laughs> in the 1970s, in his power. Next stage. From 1993 on, prime ministers have been either the children or grandchildren of the politicians. In other words, they need either second or third generation. In general, in general, their knowledge about policy or ability to unify people does not come up to the level of the previous generations. Japanese politics and economies have become unstable. Moreover, in most cases, the prime minister cannot speak English. Okay? <laughs> or what do you think? It's easy to figure out, isn't it? If you hang on to this, there's no need to remember the names of the individual prime ministers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, finally, I attracted the attention you. <laughs> now, this periodization of the Japanese politics reflects the change in the Japanese society. Change in the, in the world, in economics, technology, local communities, political parties, all sorts of change are represented as a change in the successive prime minister. Okay? Did you get that? Ah, oh, this is a graph of the, you know, economic developments in Japan. And uh, these chronological markers, however, are by no means unique to Japan. 1945, 1991, and 1955. 
1945 marked the end of the World War II, and 1991, the end of the Cold War. And uh, in 1955, comes in the period when Stalin died, and the Korean War ended, and the compromise between the US and the Soviet Union produced a stable Cold War War dust. And we can see that Japanese historical markers coordinate with these of the world, okay? If there is something distinctive about Japan, it is that 1973, an important marker elsewhere, does not stand out in Japan. In the other developed countries, the heightening of the social movement in 1968 and the oil crisis of 1973 led to economic and political change in the 1980s. Numerous kinds of social movement emerged during that period. There were similar developments in Japan, but they are not as conspicuous as in other countries. Okay? May I move next? Next. This period, from the later half of the 1970s to the beginnings of the 90s, is also the time when Japan, as an exception, attracted the interest of the researchers from the all around the world. And it is also the period when social movement in Japan was sluggish. But in order to understand present-day Japan, it is necessary to reflect on Japan in that period. That is why I focus on 1970s and 80s, okay? Next. There are a number of the features of Japan in the latter half of the 1970s. Uh, through the early 90s that distinguished it from other countries. During this period in Japan, people of low educational attainment tend to vote at higher rates than the highly educated. This is the opposite of the trend seen in the other developed countries. Yeah? Why? Further, next second feature. The number of the people employed in manufacturing also increased in Japan during this time, until 1992. This number peaked in 1992. This too opposed to the trend in other developing countries in 1970s and 80s. What is the underlying reason for these features? As a matter of fact, the numbers of the employed in manufacturing declined in Japan after, right after the oil shock. However, but they began to increase again in the latter half of the 1970s and the growth that continued until 1992. A number of the uh, theories have been advanced to explain this phenomenon. But whatever the reason, in the late 1970s and early 80s, Japan was taking the place of the US and Europe where manufacturing had declined. You know, Japan was a factory in the world at that time. The US trade deficit with Japan was one consequence. In 1984, one fourth of the US trade deficit with Japan resulted from exports to the US by American corporation located in Japan <laughs> and order for parts and, you know, OEM contracts by American corporations. In other words, you know, Japan was outsourced from the U.S. at that time. And uh, we could say that Japan in the 1980s was the factory of the world holding a position comparative to China in the 2000s. And once the Cold War was over and China entered the world market, Japanese manufacturing industries began its decline. In those days, thanks to the flourish of the manufacturing sector, the employment situation and the politics were stable in Japan. But this stability was of a nature that gave the impression that Japan was exceptional. Ah, uh, yeah, I think Japan is better, right? Okay. Uh, may I move to the next? Uh, what was, uh, you know, exceptional? 
In the field of the Japanese politics, famous journalist Curtis classic work, Election Campaigning Japanese Style, is a well-known work. Published in 1971. Have you read? Please raise a hand if you would have read. No? Oh, only one word? Yeah, yeah, you should read. Yeah, this is very interesting work. Yes. And uh, yes, the book, you know, recounts the election campaign of a lower house candidate from the Liberal Democratic Party, the conservative ruling party, with his local committee as a base, Oita Prefecture in Kyushu. And the politicians of the LDP mobilized numerous communities, uh, farming villages, uh, and shopkeeper and trade associations, uh, shotenkai, chonaikai, so on, and uh, in their vote getting campaigns. The candidate would make, you know, go aisatsu, kote <laughs> uh, on influential parties in those associations, and they, in turn, would mobilize their network and gather votes for those candidates. Okay? Curtis was initially surprised by this mode of the campaigning, but then, yeah, he thought that in fact, it resembled the campaign style of the Democratic Party in New York in the 1950s, uh, where he grew up. And back then, the Democratic Party in U.S. were mobilized networks of the immigrant communities for gathering votes. That is, was his understanding. And Curtis anticipated that modernization would force change on this form's election campaigning. And yet, nearly 50 years later, even now, the LDP mode of the election you know, has campaign has not changed in its essence. It is as if modernity had been stopped. Okay. Let me explain. Next. There are two principal ways of, to explain why this was possible. The first has to do with the regulation of the law, election law, as regulated election so as to forbid the implementation of the new wave of the conduction elections. Until 2013, it was forbidden to use the internet in elections. And political parties cannot advertise on television even now, and politicians can give speech only at a given place at a given times even now. And the uh, basic form of this law uh, goes back to 1925. Yes, this is a uh, governmental official poster at 1925 for the preparation of the universal suffrage. And when the universal Manfred suffrage, yes, in Manfred suffrage, yes, was adopted as a, you know, precaution against the growth of the, you know, proletarian parties, political parties, the more numerous due restrictions, the greater the advantage for the conservative candidate, which already accessed to the community networks. Okay, do you understand? And the second reason, that is more critical, has to do with the effort to stop communal disintegration, disintegration through political policy. Government funds were used for public works, construction works, and so on, and attempting to stem population flow from rural to urban areas and provide subsidies to shopkeeper associations and trade associations and so on. And it caused the maintaining of the commonality. And since this aspect is relevant not just to elections, but to Japanese society as a whole, let me explain further, okay? And uh, <laughs> yes, it is not as if individual politicians were consciously trying to obstruct the onset of the modernization. Rather, in order to be elected, they practice clientelism, thereby maintaining the communities that were the object of the clientelism. That was the reason. When faced with opposition communities, uh, for example, labor unions and so on, the LDP would adopt 
neoliberal policies, such as privatization and those policies distinct to help maintain communities. And uh, yes, this is the end of the National Railroad, <laughs> 1987, privatization. And it, uh, you know, uh, the goal was, you know, crushing labor unions in National Railroad. And uh, even though they lacked consistency, policies that served to maintain communities could be put into practice because there was the budget to sustain public works and provide subsidies at that time. Because that was a golden era in Japanese economy. <laughs> and this was possible because Japan at that time held the position of the factory of the world and its economy was performing well. And such policies were successful for the time, from the latter half of the 1970s to the first half of the 1980s. The rural to urban population flow declined. And various statistics show that the income gap in Japan was its smallest during this period. It means, you know, around 1980. And so-called, you know, Japan as an old middle class, society have been established in that era. And this was the time period when the invention of the tradition took place all over Japan. The publishing and tourist industries flourished and the regional traditional culture was, so-called traditional culture, were newly acclaimed. And the regional government and the businesses set out to develop local industry and specialty products. Enka, do you know? Uh, traditional Japanese blues, brass, yeah. Uh, performance with electric guitar and you know, electric organs. That was impossible without modern technology. <laughs> and uh, August Bone Festival. Have you watched the Bone Festival? Yeah, please raise your hand if you have watched. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, this is a picture of the Bone Festival <laughs> in August. And uh, yes. They were wearing synthetic kimono. <laughs> and yes, music were provided from the loudspeaker, electric, amplified. And it shows it's, uh, it was possible only you know, thanks of the modern technology. And uh, in the eyes of the foreigners, Japan in these day, those days, those days, seemed to be a society where, along with flourishing technology and manufacturing, the income gap was small, and politics stable, labor and education sector characterized by a high degree of the morality, and local communities maintained, traditional culture preserved, and which, moreover, safe. And in a word, it seems to be a country that had provided a model of the response to modernity's challenging problem. It means how to have both development and stability. And it was in 1979 that Ezra Vogel, Japan's number one, was published. And we must say that the stereotypical view of the Japan persisting to even this day was constructed in that period. Okay? Uh, have you read you know, Vogel's work? Please raise your hand. Oh, okay, <laughs> see? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yet, this sort of stability was the other side of the coin of the low political participation. And the regional and the trade groups communities maintained by the LDP, dominance by the senior world's rule. And uh, yes, and this was linked with the exclusion of the women and young people from decision making. This is a party of the uh, business community in local areas. And uh, this is a picture of the LDT candidate uh, back support group, Koenkai. <laughs> yes. And those who dislike this arrangement, particularly those with high educational background, tend to live from the major cities. 
And this tendency was strengthened by the fact that even if they were able to obtain employment in the province thanks to public policy, it was often not the sort of the employment attractive to well-educated types, construction, and so on. <laughs> yes. Uh, physical works, manufacturing, and so on. And this meant that it was the less well-educated and senior citizens who tend to stay behind in the provincial constituencies. And those seniors tend to have lower educational levels than young people. In their regional and trade networks, they voted for LDP politicians. That was what led to the higher voting rates on the part of the less educated. Okay? And this is a picture of the, you know, supporter groups, the LDP candidate. Yeah, as you watch, all of them were middle-aged males. <laughs> And what happened in the cities? To be sure, there were neighborhood and trade associations that supported the LDP in cities too, but they you know, were not as influential as in the provinces. Yeah, naturally, they are weak in the city. At the same time, because of the modernizing trend and the advent of the neoliberal policies, labor unions, in other words, other kinds of communities, were beginning to lose their ability to attract members. This led to the atomization of the urban population and the decline of the voting rate. There was no organization where, who, which could attract, atomize the people in the city, I mean. And this is highly unique to Japan, but the people who don't belong to any sort of the network tend to have a low voting rate. And this is because it is harder for them to feel as if they had a place in the world, taking place in the world as a member of the community, labor union, workplaces, communities, and so on. Uh, or to see any incentive for being interested in politics without any, you know, network, without any information, and so on. And the political science research in Japan showed that as that those who have resided in a given area for fewer than three years in the world, people who don't belong to any network have a low voting record in Japan, maybe all over the world. That causes decline of the voting rates. Because moving, moving, moving is a trend of the globalization and modernization, uprooted from the communities. And the Japanese public offices in Election Act forbid door-to-door -door conversing speeches in any but designated areas at designated times and television advertising. It means nobody attracts at most people. <laughs> and consequently, if you do not belong to a regional or workplace network that gathered the votes for the political party, you are likely to have few opportunities to come into contact with political discussion in Japan. Since these restrictions are favorable to politicians who have been elected under the current system, that is why they are you know, this inclined to change it. Even now, these kind of ceremonies well, could be watched in elections in the now. And uh, to be sure, there were efforts to organize new networks in urban areas in 1960s or 70s. Some of the young people who moved to the cities in the 1960s became adherents of the Buddhist group supporting the Komeito, Soka Gakkai, uh, and the Buddhist religion party, the Komeito is a Buddhist religion party, and the other joined the youth group of the Communist Party. And many of the immigrants at that time in the city were the youth ages, youth generation factory workers and small shop workers and so on. And this led to the growth of the these two parties during that period. Uh, yes, change of the society reflected to the, you know, party system. 
The people mobilized by these parties tend to be the less well-educated of those who migrated to the cities because they didn't have any network in the city. If they would be a big corporation employees, labor union would organize them. It means, uh, you know, because they are lower educated, they could not get big corporation jobs. Uh, students also. And uh, the 1960s also saw vigorous activity on the party, part of the new left student movement. And from the 1960s into the 1970s, citizens' movement emerged in the cities. This is a famous anti-Vietnam War movement in Japan. And the intellectuals and the highly educated housewives were the actors sustaining these movements. And these were where all development on the part of the highly educated part of the people, intellectuals, and highly educated housewives. It means middle class housewives. And married with you know, high income husband. <laughs> but they could not you know, job, get a job because of the discrimination against women. In Japan, many of the males residing in cities were absent from their neighborhoods during the day, being at workplaces located far away. And those who stayed close to home during the day tend to be farmers or self-employed people who, by and large, support the Liberal Democratic Party. Farmers Association, local association, merchant associations, and so on. Uh, but intellectuals, such as college professors, lawyers, and physicians, who did not commit to the work, as well as highly educated housewives, unable to find jobs because of the decrease action women, also tend to be in their own neighborhoods by day, in daytime. And these were the people who became active in citizen movement in 1960s and 70s. That also, reality of the society uh, reflected into the social movement, the way of the social movement, okay? And about in the 1980s, these activities saw a decline. The principal reason is that while the communities supporting the LDP were strengthened by the subsidy and the public works, by policy, and the labor unions that had made common cause with the citizens' group movement were weakened by policies, privatization, neoliberal reforms. And the second reason is that along with the modernization and the rise in educational levels, intellectuals and students began to lose a sense of the mission with respect to politics. They were, in other words, losing a sense of themselves as an establishment or elite. Yeah. It means, you know, in 1960, in Japan, late of the, you know, in entering of the university was only 10%, less than 10%. But uh, in 1973, it increased 37%. Dramatically changed. And the third reason is that as discrimination against women in employment lessened, oh, there were fewer, fewer highly educated stay-at-home wives. Yeah, that is a good thing. However, it caused the declining of the social movement in local areas. In this way, from the latter half of the 1970s into the first half of the 1990s, social movement entered a period of sluggishness. That the economy was doing well at that time, yes, and people had relatively few complaints bolstered this trend. And the people in local communities and business groups continue to vote for the LDP ruling party, conservative ruling party in Japan. And this is what produced the situation whereby those with lower education levels had a higher voting rate than those with high education attainment. Okay? And this situation 
contrasted with that prevailing in other developed countries at that time, I mean the 1970s or 80s and 90s. And uh, internationally acknowledged it as a factory of the world, with policies sustaining domestic communities, Japan was able to hold the post-1970 political and social change to a minimum. It means, you know, in Japan, 1973 was not so much critical point marked as a marker of the period. And for this reason, too, social movement failed to expand as they did in other developed countries, I mean 1970s or 80s. Okay? Next, chapter three, change of the title. And with the end of the Cold War, however, the situation in Japan began to change as well. First of all, manufacturing moved overseas, with the result that the number of the doors employed in manufacturing industry in 2013 amounted to only two-thirds of the what it was in 1992. In order to compensate for the loss of job, public works projected increased with Consequences that in 1998, construction accounted for, you know, number of those construction workers occupied 11% of the total employment. This, however, led to huge budget deficit and public service decline in the 2000s. It shows, you know, number of the labors in manufacturing industries. Okay? Maybe my English somewhat lacking dignity, but it would be better okay, than Japanese, okay. In turn, this led to the decline of the regional economies and the population drain into the city. And yet, permanent employment was hard to combine in the cities. Many of the those who had migrated into the cities took work in the construction, service, welfare, and nursing care industries and elderly cares, or so on. But these sectors tend to offer only unstable employment. And such unstable employment now accounts for fully 40% of the total employment in Japan today. Uh, this is, uh, you know, protest movement of the, you know, unregular workers, unstable workers in Japan. LDP top three. <laughs> Urban uh, migration and the decline of the public works weakened the base of the LDP. Liberalization of the trade and the privatization of the postal service had a like effect. Membership in the party, I mean the LDP, which amounted to 5.47 million in 1991. Yeah. Yeah. All well, LDP reflects Japanese society very well. 1991 is the peak of the Japanese economy. <laughs> and declined to 730,000 in 2012. And if we look at the transformation in membership in the 2000s of the LDP chapter uh, branch of the Aichi Prefecture, we find that the construction branch and the postal service branch declined in 90%. Yeah, that was because decline was the public works because of budget deficit and the introduction of the neoliberal reforms and the privatization of the postal offices. It was introduced in 2005. And of course, uh, atomization, modernization, information technology, globalization affected on the local society and the people going to my atomized and depopulated and migrated into the city. And despite these changes, party politics and election campaigns remain to the same even nowadays. General interest in politics failed to rise. The old organizations continued to weaken, and the voting rate kept falling. That is the situation. Maybe all over the world. And from 1999, the LDP, in order to show up its position, formed a coalition with the Komeito, uh, it means a Buddhist party in Japan, uh, said to, which has, you know, Komeito has, you know, control 8 million votes, actually. In spite of this, however, from 1995, candidates officially backed by the LDP for government, governor's races, 
in large cities such as Tokyo and Osaka often lost. One of the reasons for this is the weakness of the LDP organizing power in major cities. But it was not the Socialist or Communist Party backed candidates who benefited was former writers or popular TV <laughs> representatives. <laughs> but he is Osaka governor. <laughs> And the decline of the LDP was also reflected in the who became a prime minister. Once the vote gathering base is weakened, only certain kind of the politician can win re 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 election. They are the ones representing agricultural districts whose communities have been relatively survived and where representation is handed down from parents, in other words, second and third generation you know, politicians. And as I have already indicated, these are the people who have become prime minister since 1993. Yes, composition of the prime minister reflect reality of the social change. And he is, this boy is prime minister Abe. <laughs> and he, smiling, is prime minister Kishi. He uh, had get, get power in late 1950s. In other words, in Japan, politicians are people who have gained popularity on television or the relatives of the famous politicians. <laughs> this is a manifestation of the weakened consciousness about the political participation as a, it to reflect, you know, society losing its robustness because of the modernization, atomization, decrease of the social capitals, and the decrease of the responsibility to taking part in the world or something, okay? But we should not say this is unique to Japan, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can talk about this situation, yeah, later. <laughs> yes. And with politics stagnant and the economy sluggish, in 2000, this function intensified in 2000. In 2009, the LDP lost in the major upset to the Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ. And this happened in the same period as when President Obama took office coincidentally. Yes, but however, DPJ burdened with a huge budget deficit was unable to affect major policy change. And uh, these were the Circumstances when the Fukushima nuclear accident took place in 2011, March of the 2011. And uh, it was two months after the Egyptian Revolution and six months before Occupy Wall Street movement. And the large scale anti nuclear movement centered in Tokyo emerged with 200,000 gathering at the Prime Minister's office in 2012, as you watch. And uh, each year since then, there has been a major protest movement around one or another topics. In every year, over 100,000 or the, some 50 or 60,000 of the people gathered in front of the national diet in every year in Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, there are several features distinguishing these movements from those of the past. Up to the 1960s, movement failed, relied on the mobilizing power of the networks formed by labor unions or political parties or students' self-governance association in each university. Uh, the leading activists were members of the political parties or labor unions, and the participants were workers belonging to labor networks or students who belong to self-governance networks. Self-governance networks mean labor unions, student associations, and so on. And the movement since 2011, however, has the following characteristics. It was different from 1960s. First of all, the sponsoring organizations 
uh, it means you know, they disseminate information for the rallies and so on. Uh, small groups, very small groups, ranging from several tens to a few hundred like-minded people who have nothing to do with political parties or labor unions. And they attract participants not through organizational mobilization, but by circulating information on the internet and social media. And secondly, many of the activists are those who have failed to secure stable employment uh, despite their highly educational levels, the so-called cognitive precariat. Uh, they are not manual levels. And uh, yes, and uh, as you have watched in the film in last night, among the activists I know were designers, self-employment information technology specialists, agent lecturers, and agent librarians. And she is a gentle library. <laughs> yes. And uh, that means they are cognitive workers, but unstable. And those engaged in regular knowledge work that has mushroomed over the past 20 years. These activists using their particular skills, you know, I mean the IT, sound equipment, music, design, to the new movements. That was why, you know, social movement after 2011 was very careful. Yes. Sadly, those who gathered have included the men and women, I mean the ordinary participants, the young and the old. They come because of the information they found on the internet, not because they are mobilized by specific network, I mean the labor unions and so on. And in that sense, these movements are different from labor movements which attract only workers, and the student movement, which only attracts students. In the summer of 2015, a student group called the SEALS Student Emergency Action for Liberal Democracy emerged in the summer. And um, they uh, mobilized 100,000 people uh, in front of the parliament buildings, national diet. And uh, that was because they protested against the you know, change of the national security policy. Uh, the government tried to introduce uh, security bills. And there were some reports in Japan, you know, this was a revival of the 1960, especially 1960 anti-US Japan security uh, treaty uh, pro protest against this treaty. But uh, I think it was totally different. SEALS, uh, Student Emerging Action for Liberal Democracy, is not uh, an organization, but rather a group of 200 or so like-minded people. Unlike the 1960s student movement, they did not seek to gain control of the movement, uh, student self-governance bodies or the mobilized participants. In other words, they only disseminate information all around the society. Yeah. They, they didn't you know, try to mobilize students in each university by using the you know, uh, community of the, in each university. And the participants were men and women, young and old, who saw this information from SIS and through social media and came out of their own accord. We should probably call this out to they, they, uh, they call this not a student movement, but movement sponsored by a group of students. Okay? And uh, we should also note that among the members of the series, a student who are already sad uh, was indebted with 6 million or 10 million yen, it means 6 million or 10 million dollars indebted by student loans. And uh, in other words, they are also cognitive precariat. And uh, even official statistics in Japan said that uh, approximately half of the Japanese students have already indebted by student loan. And the situation of sales members reflects the change in the Japanese student population overall. That is one of the reasons they are totally different from 1960s. 
And what is of the interest is that this movement takes, this movement not only saying in Japan, but also all over the world, you know, takes the form of occupying the public spaces in front of the prime minister's, uh, in Japanese case, in front of the prime minister's residence or the parliament building for a given period of time. And the participant made a speech. Do you remember? You know, analysis of the, uh, Hannah Arendt. Yeah. And one after another. And these features show commonality with the movement that arose in various parts of the world after 2011. We can say that the Japanese movement have unfolded as a part of the what has been going on in the rest of the world. Okay? Next, final chapter. Now then, and the difference between the, this movement, I mean the you know, social movement since 2011, and the new social movement of the 1970s or 80s, and what about the ability to influence elections? That is very critical. And in the following, I shall speak to these two points, okay? Firstly, there are the features that are shared by contemporary movements, I mean, the, since 2011, the new social movement of the 1970s, different. Both emerged from, uh, you know, the movement in 1970s and the contemporary movement shared, you know, some sense of the features. Both emerged from the groups unrelated to the political parties and labor unions. That is commonality between 1970s and contemporary movements. And but there are distinguished characteristics as well. In the 1970s, students and highly educated women attracted attention as new actors in 1970s. In the present movement, however, activists represent a you know, broader spectrum of the cognitive precariat with respect to the age and gender. That means you know, as well, participants in the 1970s in no new social movement represent specific affiliations. It means students, housewives, immigrants, etc. It means they are isolated people from political system. Isolated people from political system. In other words, I dare to say, peripheralized people. And uh, it is for this reason that the movement took the form of the feminist group, movement or ethnic movements and uh, identity politics. But the current movement draws on the variety of the generations and the social strata. This difference is also reflected in the slogans that were used. While many of the 1970s activists invoked their specific identifying characteristics, that was the slogan at that time, but nowadays, the current movement used the slogan, we are the 90-90%. That means we are majority, not minority. <laughs> we are not peripheries. <laughs> and this is because it doesn't represent a gathering of the particular minority or those with other specific attributes. That to explain, we cannot find specific attributes in participants. Younger generation, older generation, many of the kinds of the people gathered you know, in contemporary social movements. In the anti-security legislation movement of the summer 2015, you know, anti-security bill movement in the summer in Japan, the slogan was, don't think you can, don't look down people, yeah. It's uh, kind of the representation of the, in Japanese context, we are 90-90%. In the 1970s, those who felt excluded from political decision making were students, highly educated women, and sexual and ethnic minorities, as I have told you, they are minorities. But today, 90-90% of the people feeling this satisfaction about being excluded from political decision making. In such a situation, identity politics would 
point is to affirm particular identities can no longer be effective in the same way, I think, in my opinion. And uh, do you think, you know, how do you think, what do you think well, when you have watched this you know, picture? You know, in 1970s, I guess that the people in 1970s thought like this, only red person isolated from the system. However, nowadays, maybe you will think like this, only one person is reflected the political decision. <laughs> Other whites are isolated from political decisions. <laughs> it's very interesting. And these characteristics may be seen around the world, but every society has its own context. For example, the reason seals was thought to represent a revival of the 1960s anti security and U.S. Japan Security Treaty movement has to do with the fact of the their shared historical context in Japanese society. It's a Japanese specific context. But uh, it's not only specific in Japan. Even in East Asia, not in Japan, but in Taiwan and Hong Kong also, you know, uh, we can find, you know, a uh, social movement which organize the groups who claim that they are student. But however, do you think is he student? Is he student or not? <laughs> Actually, uh, I have talked with you know I talked with a Taiwanese activist and uh, some and others uh, who occupied national diet in Taiwan in 2014 was not a student, but uh, it was very convenient, you know, to claim we are student because. East Asian society, student might be respected. And in this way, the social context will affect the nature of the movement and the way in which it will be recognized in each society. But as a researcher, we ought to pay attention to the universal features underlying various contexts, I think. Okay. We have to rush. <laughs> What kind of impact will this movement have on the elections? That is not simple matters. Keep in mind that the participants in the current movement do not have a particular social characteristics. They are not organized within a particular network. The sole commonality is their dysfunction with being excluded from political decision making. Therefore, even though they are able to come together in protest of a particular issue, it is hard for them to entertain a shared vision of the future. It is also hard for them to organize voting around the particular party or candidate. Consequently, even if tens of thousands appear together on the stage of the activism, the parties they support are various and they have trouble making an impact on elections. And uh, this situation, I guess, that it was caused by mismatch between society in 21st century and the political system which was established in 20th century. Many organizations, including political parties, which gained power in 20th century are not, you know, functioning to representing the reality of the people in 21st century. However, yeah, yes, not however. <laughs> this is the reason 90% of the people are feeling isolation from the political system. All the things might be the, the other way around. Social movement in 21st century have failed to adapt to 20th century's political system. <laughs> it might be the other way around, but uh, it's a reality. And in countries that have not adapted to the yeah, this is, uh, you know, uh, each context of the, each society. In countries that have not adopted the pro proportional representation system, proportional constituent system, it is virtually unknown for a party emerging from a social movement to make it to the na national parliament. Yeah, you may understand, you know, the reason of the emerging of the Green Party in Germany. They have proportional constituency in nationwide. And uh, 
Japanese election system consists mostly single seat constituencies and does not have a presidential system. In other words, there are no elections for politicians represented in the entire country nationwide. And in single seat constituency, 7% or 8% vote mean nothing. And even if 200,000 people gather in Tokyo, it will have no direct impact on the regional elections. This means that it's difficult to influence national elections, at least without covering of the mass media. If we interest inspect elections results, we see that the Conservative LDP Komeito, uh, LDP Komeito, LBT is a conservative ruling party in Japan, and Komeito is a Buddhist party who will make coalition with LDP. Uh, it you know, made, a, you know, compose a conservative coalition. Uh, they control about 30% of the population in each, in each single seat constituency. In 2009, when this coalition was defeated by the DPJ, the voting rate was 69%. At that time, 40% defeated 30%. <laughs> and furthermore, in that election, the DPJ uh, cooperated with other opposition parties and managed to feed a unified candidate in each single seat constituencies. That was why 40% defeated 30%. And uh, such circumstances lead to the possibility of the defeat for the conservative coalition, even if it controls 30% of the vote in each single city constituency. And uh, at the same time, they are declining, as I have told you, because of neighborhood reform, globalization, information technology. But the DPJ administration's response to the nuclear disaster provoked despair. As a result, many DPJ supporters stopped voting. The voting rate has never exceeded 60% in elections from 2012 on. And given these circumstances, the conservative coalition, which, you know, secure commands of the 30% of the vote, assures its victory, definitely. And if the position cannot nullify fragmented conservative victory became even more certain. That is the situation. As this situation came to be recognized in the process of these five years in social movements, uh, the anti-security registration movement in 2000, security bill movement of 2015 began to encourage electoral cooperation among the opposition parties. Of course, it was not easy to bring about large-scale change in election results in a short period of time, but we can say that social movement have brought about a certain revitalization of the political system. Now, conclusion. Present day, Japan is seeing instability, a crisis of politics. Crisis politics not only meaning, you know, isolation of the people, dysfunction of the political system also, and even conservative coalition have been declining. Maybe in the future, Total chaos would have happened. And the uh, rise of the social movement would cover or not this situation. And about these future are not unique to Japan, but rather phenomena common to the rest of the world now making their appearance within the Japanese context. Keeping this in mind, we recognize that in order to understand Japan, we need to understand the world. At the same time, in order to understand the world, we need to understand Japan, not only in Japan, maybe all around the world. Because if we would watch only our own country, we cannot realize what things going on in global world. And there is a reason, and here is a reason here is the reason why researchers from various countries can and need to cooperate with each other. I hope my talk today might serve as an occasion for you to understand Japan and to understand the world in which you live.
Thank you for your attention.